Let us look at the Word of God today. Today's Word of God is Matthew 5, verses 8 to 42. Matthew chapter 5, 38 to 42. Let us read it all together. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Amen. Now our senior pastor will come out and preach with the title, The Correct Understanding of the Law of Retaliation. And so last time we talked about the law of retaliation and the first point, which is on uh, the Old Testament, um, the law of retaliation in the OT. And then second, we talked about the main point of Jesus' teachings, that uh, we should not go against, do not resist the evil one. And third, today we will talk about the specific action plans that Jesus presented. Jesus explained to us how we should lay down our revenge and how we should not resist the evil ones. And he gave us specific and practical examples of this. Matthew 5, 39 to 42. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So if you look at these things, you see that it's one uh, where you are insulted, second, when you're sued in court, third, when you're conscripted by Roman soldiers, and fourth, being asked for money lending. And so it starts from the order of the most offensive to the least. And so I want to talk about three out of these four points. And then I know the fourth point is the one that you guys are all the most curious about, but we'll talk about it in our next sermon. And the thing with the series sermons is that um, I can never plan uh, just exactly as how I want it to be. For example, sometimes it's kind of like a Bible study and it, where you're learning things. Other times you have a lot of grace and you receive a lot of blessings from the Word. But I think the last three weeks has been all Bible study. And so it's been a um, calm time of Bible study. And I'm not sure what the other times will be like. But anyways, this is how it's been these days. But today we'll continue. And the first point is, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Has anyone here been slapped before? I think maybe a couple times. So when I was um, in high school, I used to be really good at art, at drawing. And so I used to like help tutor even my um, um, people who were older than me. And so later, uh, it was almost like they were in a gang. But um, uh, when I told them that I wanted to leave the art club, they they, uh, brought me up to... uh, They brought me up to the rooftop, and then they hit, slapped me. Uh, The thing, the reason why I wanted to leave our art club was when you were in junior high, my senior, uh, when I was in eighth grade, I only lived in the art club, and in the art uh, room, art classroom, and I was drawing all the time, and I, uh, I didn't bring a backpack to school because uh, I knew I wasn't going to study or I left it uh, uh, on my chair, and then I would go to the art classroom. And there was once a time that I was absent for three days, and nobody knew that I was absent because they thought I was just uh, in the art classroom. And so I received the perfect attendance award because nobody knew that I wasn't there. 
But anyways, you know, your eighth grade years are very important because depending on your grades in eighth grade, you go to good high school. And so, you know, you used to have summer homework and uh, my homeroom teacher asked me to draw um, instead of doing the summer homework. And so I was exempt from summer homework because I was allowed to draw a picture instead. And so anyways, this is how I used to spend my time. But um, during that summer, I studied really, really hard to be able to go into a good high school. But my basics, my foundations for schooling, for education wasn't that great. And so even in high school, I continued to just draw, continued to spend time in art. And so I realized halfway through, during my second year, during sophomore, junior year, that I couldn't continue this way, that I, I needed to start studying more if I wanted to go into seminary. So even though these um, seniors who really loved me in uh, the art school, he slapped me. And then um, I snapped my brush, my paintbrush, and I decided to leave the club. Uh, and then I studied more to be able to go to seminary school. So anyways, being slapped is sometimes worse than other types of violence because, you know, to slap someone, it's, it's one of the most insulting things to do to a person, to be hit, right, to be slapped on your cheek. And if they were slapped on your right side, on your right cheek, it means that either a left-hand person hit you with their palm or a right-handed person hit you with the back of one's hand. So, you know, there are more right-handed people. So it means that they're hit by the back of their hand. And in the Near East, um, this was something that was incredibly barbaric. Not only being slapped, but being backhanded is an even worse offense. That is why if you were hit um, by the back of one's hand, you were slapped by the back of one's hand, you had to pay a penalty of a year's wages. And you can see this in the rabbi's sentencings. Everyone is in accord with one station. This means if he smacks him, he pays 200 zuz. But the text continues. If it is with the back of the hand, he pays him 400 zuz. And so these days as well still, uh, in the East, it's not uh, talking about the Asia's East, right? I think it's talking about the Near East. Anyways, in the Near East, it is still a great insult to hit someone with the back of your hand. So According to the law of retaliation, what should happen, right? If they hit my right cheek, right, then you need to, it, even if you're not both their cheeks, you need to at least hit their right cheek, right? According to the law of retaliation. But while explaining the law of retaliation, what does Jesus say? He says something incredibly uh, absurd, right? He says to the person who, who was slapped on the cheek, he says, if you were hit on the right cheek, right, and your cheek is smarting, he says to turn the other cheek. So this is a very strange thing to say. But this is actually something that Jesus himself fulfilled. He's not just saying, you should do this. He was someone that actually did it first. And he was that role model. And, and then he asked us to do it as well. In the Old Testament, this is what it says about Jesus. In Isaiah 56, I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. This is how it's recorded. So Jesus actually fulfilled this word, and he lived out this word. If you look in Mark, there were um, religious leaders, Jewish leaders that spit on him, and then their slaves hit him. It, 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 you can see it recorded in Mark 14, 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy, and the guard received him with blows. That's how it's recorded. But Jesus did not respond. He did not respond. He did not resist them. And he had not even one ounce of retaliation or revenge inside of him. And so Peter is one of the disciples who saw this, who saw this with his own eyes, right? 
And so Peter later on he recorded this event in First Peter, and this is what he wrote in chapter two twenty one to twenty three. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And so it's important to work by his word, but this is also incredibly important, right? It's important to be holy. It's important to live this faithful life, but God asks us even more than that. Right, because Jesus was the model, the example, we need to also do this. And Martin Luther King lived out exactly like Jesus showed us. Right, he was hit by the knife of a fellow black man. It's as if, like our church, uh, is stabbed multiple times by other churches, by other pastors, by other Christians. Right, we we uh, are received as if they are robbers to us, and we've been attacked that way for over ten years. But in the same way, Martin Luther King was hit by the knife of a fellow black man, beat up in hotel lobbies, and was unjustly assaulted. But he did not resist them, and he did not revenge himself. And so that's why ben, Dr. Benjamin May, Mays said this. It's a very um, touching word. And he says, and yet this man had no bitterness in his heart. And I think it's something that we can um, use as an example. Yet this man had no bitterness in his heart, no rancor in his soul, no revenge in his mind. And so this is what the Lord desires of us. Right, this is what he desires from us. He wants us to be like this, because this is what the Lord was like, and this is what Martin Luther King was like. And so, this is the kind of person, this is the kind of level that he wants us to get to, and that is the will of the Lord. On the other hand, um, Professor Turner uh, criticized this, and he did say uh, there is no actual need to really turn the other cheek. And Arthur Pink said the following. But whosoever shall smite on thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. There has been some controversy in certain quarters as to whether or not these words are to be considered literally. The question may be answered more readily by asking: Are they to be regarded absolutely or comparatively? Obviously, it must be the latter. First, were we to turn the other cheek to the smiter, we should be tempting him unto sin by inviting him to repeat the offense, which is manifestly wrong. And so, you know, to turn the other cheek, is this something that is literal or comparative? Arthur Pink says this is not literal. If this was literal, and, uh, you know, whenever someone hits your right cheek, you need to let them hit your left cheek, he's saying that's, that's um, tempting the person, right? You're, you're tempting them. Uh, you're provoking them, right? And they're going to be like, oh, look at this uh, person. Oh, okay, I'm going to do it. Right? You, you might even make someone more violent by provoking them. So this is why we shouldn't just take it as is. And of course, still, there are some times that there are good results from being literal. Because if you look in Sunder Singh's um, teachings in the book, The Cross is Heaven, there is this testimony. It says, turn the other cheek. As I was walking in the main bazaar along with a preacher, I went up to a movie. A movie is an Indian Muslim teacher. He bitterly opposed the preaching, but I'd been standing and listening too. So angry did he become that he gave me a cuff, on which I turned the other cheek to him. He was ashamed and remained silent. At midnight, He sent a man to the preacher, saying, "Kindly arrange for me to meet the sadhu, so that I might ask his forgiveness for my fault, for I cannot sleep." At that time, however, I was at some distance away, and it was not until morning that the preacher could make inquiries and get at me. He said, "The movie calls you to dine with him." Glory to God that He changed His heart entirely. And so there was a good result for Sun. Right when He turned the other cheek, this uh, in this case there was a good 
uh, good outcome. But I think this was all, maybe because this was a movie. Even though it's another religion, he's a religious leader. So, you know, he's trying to live more morally than, um, you know, the common man. And he's trying to live ethically. So maybe that's why this worked for him. And in the case of Brother Yoon in the book, The Heavenly Man, you guys all read this before. In that book, there's a very interesting um, testimony. I, I really like uh, the name of the village. And so in the Gao village, right? When I first shared at Gao village, the Lord gave me scripture songs to sing before the people. They wrote down the words so they could remember them. One of the songs was taken from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus tells us if someone strikes us on the right cheek, we should turn our other cheek to him as well. Another song taught how we are to rejoice greatly when we are persecuted for the sake of the Gospel. Yet another song explained how we should never be like Judas and deny our Master. After so many people came to Jesus at once, it caught the attention of the police. All the Christians in Gao village were arrested and taken to the police station. The officers demanded to know, who brought the name of Jesus to you? How did you all come to believe in this superstition? The believers were filled with overwhelming joy. The only thing they would say was this, we won't be like Judas. We won't betray our Lord Jesus. The officers started to beat them, and they rejoiced even more. They said, please, sir, hit us on the other side of the face as well. Right? The officers are beating them up, and they're saying this. The Christians were laughing and rejoicing. The officers grew tired of beating them and finally said, you Christians are all crazy. Right? They're beating them, and then they say, sir, hit us on the other side. Right? So the officers, right, they say, you Christians are all crazy. And then they sent them home. Right? Because they're crazy. But it's not always a good result that happens from such a case. Right? If you read Son Yang Won by Son, it's a very a touching book. But in there, there's a story that we cannot laugh at. It was when he was in the Cheongju detention house. One day, one of the guards came and deprived him of the Bible and hymn book he had. And he brought a bunch of Buddhist books and put it in front of him. My father read all the books. One prominent Japanese Buddhist monk came and sat before him who read all the bu Buddhist books given when he read all of it. He was sent by the warders to conciliate my father. A heated debate took place between them over is Christianity truth or Buddhism truth? For several hours, the argument continued, and neither of them was giving an inch. That Japanese monk was despising Christianity in his heart, thinking of it as a lowbrow religion. Their debate was getting even more heated. However, as time passed, it was that monk who was running out of words to say. The awareness that he was losing the upper hand in the religious debate to a mere prisoner must have exacerbated him. He suddenly rose up and slapped my father in the face, saying, How dare you challenge and try to defeat me? My father quietly spoke to this maddened monk. The follower of greatly merciful Buddha hit this pitiful prisoner on the cheek. But I, a faithful son of God, will follow Jesus' teaching. Jesus said, if a man hits your right cheek, turn the other one to him as well. So please go ahead and hit me on the other side as well. You arrogant brat, how dare you try to defeat me? The Japanese monk was out of his mind, and he was b going berserk and jumped onto my father. The prison warders, who were surprised by the noise, ran in and took him out. Otherwise, a very ugly scene must have been created. After that day, my father was given a punishment. His rations, her rations were reduced to half. Since he was being given already a very small portion, and they even further reduced, reduced it to half, it was almost as if eating nothing. The moment he put down his spoon and turned around, he was already hungry. The portion reduced was like the size of a persimmon. It wasn't enough to survive, but wasn't enough to die either. And the punishment wasn't just a reduced portion of meal. The detention center demanded him to read Buddhist books and write and submit a book report every day. There was no other presumable reason for the punishment than an obvious revenge from the Japanese monk who was humiliated by my father. And so this Japanese monk was really cheap in his revenge. But um, I have to say, Pastor uh, 
Yang Won Son is one of the greatest pastors that came about in Korea. I think he might be greatest uh, man of God in our country. But our uh, this pastor, Pastor Son, uh, maybe because he was debating him, I think he did something that was worth being slapped for. Okay, if you look at the context, right? He's someone who's full of love. And he's a great person, but you know, depending on how you say things, right? It's different, right? After he was hit by the um, slapped, he says this: "The follower of greatly merciful Buddha hit this pitiful prisoner on the cheek, but I, a faithful son of God, will follow Jesus's teaching." Jesus said, "If a man hits your right cheek, turn the other one as well." So please go ahead and hit me, right? And this is provoking the man. And so it's an interesting example, but it's that from time to time, sometimes it provokes the situation and it makes this aggravates the situation. And it's not always the wisest thing to do. It's not always the best way uh, to create a scenario to go about um, acting. And so that is why it's not always the case that uh, you should always turn your cheek. That's why Lloyd Jones says this: "I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also." What does this mean in the light of the general principles we have enunciated earlier? It means that we must rid ourselves of the spirit of retaliation, of the desire to defend ourselves, and to revenge ourselves for any injury or wrong that is done to us. And so this is not just saying that we should turn our left cheek. It's basically saying that you should not resist or revenge the wicked. Basically, it's saying do not have this heart of revenge, or anger, or resentment. That those grudges need to be gone. That make you act that way. That you need to act in such a way that where you're not resisting things, like P Pastor Martin Luther King, and the way that he ha thinks. Right, that's what Jesus desires. Not just the action of turning your left cheek. What Jesus truly desires is the the heart of Pastor Martin Luther King to be that person. And so we need to understand what this is truly saying. And so someone might listen to what I just said, and they might think, "Oh, aren't you weakening Jesus's argument?" No. That is not the case because if you look in Isaiah 56, it says, "I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard." And it's that Jesus actually did not resist these people, and he did give them his cheek. However, even in those um, significant examples in the Bible that I read earlier, right? Did Jesus actually give his left cheek, right? When he is striked, when um, they pull out the beard, when they hit him, does it does it say that he actually turned his cheek? No, it's that Jesus did not have the heart of revenge. He did not have a heart of hatred, and so instead of resisting against them, he stood still, and he received all that abuse. So what Jesus is wanting is this: is that Jesus is. Model his example cannot be imperfect, right? And so he's showing us. He gave us the perfect example of what to do when you are persecuted, and so that is what you need to be doing. And if you look in John 18, it says this: John 18, 22 to 23. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, "Is this how you answer the high priest?" Jesus answered him, "If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong." But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And so, in this example, we see uh, the officers who were struck by Jesus. When they struck Jesus uh, with their hand, he uh, protested against it. He did not protest it with violence. He did not protest the violence with violence. But he did protest it. Because he was not working towards uh, the mindset of revenge, but he was working towards the mindset of justice, and so he did acknowledge that it was wrong to do that to him. And uh, Apostle Paul was not against it either. He says this: Acts twenty-three, two to three. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, "God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck." 
And so the high priest Ananias strike, uh, commanded to, uh, you know, him to be strike down on the mouth. Paul then didn't say, okay, then strike me again. He doesn't say that. He says, God is going to strike you, right? Are you going sitting to judge me? Yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck, right? He says that. He acts out against unlawfulness. And so the teaching of to turn your left cheek is not a action. It's not a, a strict principle, a rule that he's trying to teach us. He's not saying if any time someone hits you on the right, you should always give your left. That's not what he's saying, right? You know, uh, um, ten, uh, Kinner, Professor Tinner thinks that Jesus is using a hyperbole. And Robert Tanhill says that this is a focal instance, that this these are focal instances. And so you need to focus on this to truly understand it. And so if you're not focused on it and you're reading these situations, you might be misunderstanding the real meaning behind it. And this is what John Stott says about it. Further, however conscientious we may be in our determination not to sidestep the implications of Jesus' teaching, we still cannot take the four little cameos with wooden unimaginative liberal literalism. This is partly because they are given not as detailed regulations, but as illustrations of a principle, and partly because they must be seen to uphold the principle they are intended to illustrate. That principle is love. And so it's saying the same thing. What is this example talking about? What is it trying to say? You cannot focus just on the example, but what is the intent behind what Jesus is saying? And it's that the principle is love. It's not just turning your left cheek. It's not just giving your cloak. Right? What's the meaning behind following something without love? It's, it's not Jesus saying and asking us to commit to this action like a robot. But it's that you need to love not only those who love you, but those who are wicked as well. So what Jesus is asking for us to do is love. And so it's not saying that you must give your left cheek. It's not that type of fixed rule. It's not saying if anyone hits you on the right, you must turn the left. That's not what it's saying. That's not that kind of fixed principle. To go even further, what Jesus has given as an example, you can see, is a very weak example. And I explained this a tiny bit last week. To say, you know, when he's talking about do not resist the evil one, he does not say, if someone strikes your right eye and blinds you, then turn the other a uh, left eye and let them strike your left eye as well. He doesn't say that. And he doesn't say if someone uh, breaks your tooth, then also let them break your other tooth. He doesn't say that. He only says if someone slaps you on the right cheek, then turn the left cheek, right? I've I've been hit on the che uh, cheek 30 times. I've been slapped 30 times and I'm still fine, right? So so being slapped is a very weak um violent act. And this is what Arthur Pink says. Christ here condemned the common practice of fighting and quarreling. Mark it well that a slap in the face is a vastly different thing from life itself being endangered. Where that is the case, flight or calling for the help of the law is our duty. Yeah, yes, we must seek to defend ourselves rather than be killed. And so isn't this an of course situation? Right? You cannot read Jesus' word ignoring common sense. Okay? You can't do that. You can't understand it in that manner. Jesus is someone who is logical. He is practical. And so this example is not saying that you cannot, you cannot sue anyone, you cannot go against anyone when, they're, uh, uh, when they have a big act of abuse against you. And when we look in Grant Osborne's writing, you can see that what it says. On the surface, it seems to reject the principle of justice, and many have rejected it throughout history. Uh, example, For example, liberation theo theologians. Uh, and he mentions liberation theologians, but these are liberation theologians are are honestly they're they're almost heretical, and they will not. Uh, it's you know okay, so they're they're another uh, thing. But anyways, continue reading. However, most agree that Jesus is speaking at the level of personal vengeance rather than legal rights. Okay, so Jesus is saying 
that, okay, you should not sue someone for slapping your cheek. But against physical abuse or bigger abuse, you can. You can sue someone in court. Even if you don't hate them, even if you don't loathe them, it's possible to ask them for reparations in court. And so in this manner, you can see um, you can see that God is not banning all types of legal action against abuse. And we see it in Paul's words as well, in Acts 25, 11 through 12. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I d deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appealed to Caesar, then Festus. Then he had conferred with his counsel and answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. And so, you know, Paul, when it, it was necessary, he appealed to Caesar. And so, you know, who is there who followed Jesus better than Apostle Paul? Right? Who is there? No. There's no one, right? There's no one else. But even Apostle Paul, when the time was necessary, he did sue people. He appealed to Caesar. And so when it's a serious situation, when you're seriously harmed and in danger, Right? It's not telling you, oh, you cannot sue anyone. Right? If someone hits you this way, you need to turn the other way. That's not what Jesus is saying. And so I hope you see the balanced nature of this teaching and you're able to be uh, practically uh, imp implant this in your lives, implement this in your lives. Amen. Uh, I think last week I asked you all to say amen a lot more. And so I think today you have said amen more than usual. Uh, you actually said it more. But if we were at a revivalist uh, conference, then uh, it would not be enough. But anyways, our second point. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And so I think you all might have thought this thought before. But... Um, I thought that it was very dirty because in the Korean, instead of tunic, it says undergarments. So I thought, oh, I can't understand this. Why are they trying to wear other people's undergarments, right? Why would they want to wear someone else's uh, underwear? Because you wouldn't even want to wear someone else's underwear even if it was washed. But it's that the translation is wrong. The Korean translation for this is incredibly wrong. Here, This tunic, this undergarment, is not the type of undergarment that we think of. During that time, the men wore two layers. And the outer layer was called a cloak. Right? You, you hear the word cloak, outer, outer garment a lot. But the inner garment, they called uh, the undergarment, right? the tunic. And so you had two layers. The outside is called the outer, outer garment. The inner is called the inner garment. And so... The kind of undergarments that we think of are inside the undergarments. So it's the under undergarment. So it's not the type of undergarment that we think of. And in Hebrew, it's kutonet. And there was not a good translation for kutonet. And so that's why they translated it in Greek as undergarment. And so this is a really absurd reason, right? Because in the past, you know, you could say a traditional Korean overcoat called turumagi, right? There are so many different ways that you can express these clothing, right? You could call it a suit, right? Or even for suits, you have outer suits or um, overcoats, right? There are ways that you can explain things in synonyms. But I think um, the translators were trying to... Um, Right, make fun of us. I don't know what they were doing. I'm actually not sure. But uh, they translated it as undergarments. And so kutoneth is very different from the type of undergarments that we would wear. Because nowadays, if you wear just your underwear outside, they would call you crazy, right? But during Jesus' time, the undergarment that you call a kutoneth could be worn outside. You could work in the fields outside just wearing your kutoneth. And so that's why it says in Matthew, it says, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. What is it saying? It's saying that he's just wearing his undergarment. Right? He's not outside. He's in the field. 
working. And it says, let not that person ta- turn back to take his cloak. And so he just wore his undergarment and is working out in the field. And so in this manner, the undergarment, although it's not a, a perfect, um, it, it's like a, your normal clothes to wear, it is still something that you could wear outside. So I think it's uh, good to explain it in this manner. I read a lot of commentaries, but um, they did show the right concept, um, but they didn't actually have the perfect image of what this kutunet could be. But um, Pastor Kim, when she was reading a book, um, she found an explanation for what this clothing might have looked like. And she gave me that page number and she said, Pastor, I think this might help you talk about the sermon this week. And I read it and it actually really was good. And so the kutonet was made out of two large cloths, one in the front, one in the back. And you would save space, had holes for the face and arms sewn together. And so that was the undergarment, right? So you would have a large hole for your face and arms, and it was then sewn together. It's a very simple um, way of clothing. Right, it would come down to your ankles and was short-sleeved. So you can imagine this perfectly, right? It's made out of white linen with holes for your face and head and arms and it's short-sleeved till your ankles. This was the undergarments of the biblical times. And so it is very different from the underwear or undergarments that we think of today. And so if you look in our main passage today, it's, it says that Jesus is giving the example of someone trying to sue one of his disciples. And we see the reason for it. And the cause was that he wanted to take the disciples' undergarment. That was the reason. And so the offender offense is being made where they are trying to sue for the undergarment. And so Jesus says to the disciples, if they want your undergarment, not only should you give the undergarment, but also give your outer cloak. And this was a very shocking thing to say. Because not only did this man not defend, is not able to defend his undergarment, Jesus is saying to even give his outer cloak. And this was shocking because according to the Jewish culture, this was a very crazy thing to say because the cloak was used even as a blanket during those times. It was something that was very important. And so you could hold it as collateral, but you could you could not take it from someone, right? Because they needed to use it as a blanket when they sleep, right? So poor people, they don't have a lot of clothing. So your outer cloak, you can use, uh, hold it as collateral, but you must return it before sun sets. And that's one of the rules, mosaic laws uh, in the Bible. Because it says in Exodus, if ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering and it is cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So this is talking about the outer cloak. And then in Deuteronomy 24, 12 through 13, it says, And if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it shall be righteous for you before the Lord your God. This is what he's saying. And so it's that those who are devoted and diligent with the small things are the ones who are big. Right? Love, true love is when you can worry about the small things, right? When you can act for the small things. And this is something that you don't know unless you've experienced it yourselves. And it's not just, you know, these small things that God is love. It shows that He is love. Right, because what is there that Jesus, uh, that God, um, you know, there's nothing that's uh, He's not left wanting for anything else. But God is truly, truly intimate with us, right? He knows everything about us, right? He's very uh, diligent and careful in how He loves us. He knows how many hairs we have on our head, right? To love, when you truly love someone, you need to have this meticulous love. 
not a love where you're showing it off to other people. You need to be like God and give that kind of love to people. And I hope you all, you and I can all emulate this type of love. And so some people, right, might be trying to just get the inner garment. But he tells them, not only should you not take your inner garment, but that you should also give them your outer garment. And that is how much you should be laying down your revenge. And that you should also be resisting the evil one. And that is the kind of mindset you should be living by and for. And that is the type of person you should become. Not to become an aggressive person or a person filled with revenge or a person who fights with others. But it's that you need to become this type of person. And that is the will of the Lord. On the other hand, this word is not saying to give to anyone who wants to take from us. And we have to be careful. And Arthur Pink says this. It is to be duly noted that the second example respects one of a tri trifling character. Right? He's, it was saying, we, we're talking about the same thing over and over again. Right? He's trying to take the inner garment. And he's saying to also give the outer gar garment. Right? When it says, it's not saying give your house or give all of your monies, right? That, that's, that's dumb. And also an evil one is trying to take it, right? And, and if he's, Jesus is not saying, oh, give all your houses, give all your bank account. Isn't that a dumb thing to do? Right? That's not what Jesus is saying. And so you cannot understand his words in such a um, ridiculous manner. Right? Okay, so he says, It is to be duly noted that this second example respects one of a trifling character, as the former concerned not the severance of a limb by the sword, but only a slap in the face. So this relates not to the seizure of our property, but merely the loss of a garment. Unless this be duly noted, we are likely to miss the force of our Lord's exhortation and make an entirely unwarrantable application. That which Christ here condemned was not the legitimate use of the courts, but the going to law over mere trif trifles, trifles. The doing so evidences a cont contentious spirit and a heart that is anxious for revenge, which ill becomes a Christian. As the apostle shows in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, yet it is all too common a practice among men in general, though there may be cases where duty requires us to take legal action against one who defrauds us, yet this must be our last resort. So he explained it very well. But some people might even, with this explanation, they might still say, isn't this still weakening Jesus' word? And that kind of concern is good. You can, you can worry about that. Because Jesus is talking about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Because these things are not talking about uh, tri trifle manners, right? These are talking about very serious accounts. So someone might say, aren't these explanations like Arthur Pink's weakening Jesus' talk about this law of retaliation that is so serious? But I believe that that is not the case because Jesus is not talking exactly about the law of retaliation, but he is rather talking about the revenge that has grown in the hearts of people who have misunderstood the law of retaliation. And so Jesus is not talking about the law of retaliation as is. He's talking about how the scribes and the Pharisees taught on the law of retaliation and how this distorted teaching has uh, led people to live out their lives. And that is the type of teaching that Jesus is talking about. Because if Jesus is talking about the law of retaliation, he cannot give these four examples. He should say, if someone strikes your eye, then you should do this. Right? The law of retaliation says to do this. It says eye for an eye, but I say this. That's what he needs to be saying. He, he should be saying, you know, the law of retaliation says if someone uh, strikes your tooth, breaks your tooth, then you should break the other tooth. But I say this, right? He should talk about the eye, the tooth, life. But he doesn't do that. 
What is this saying? It's saying that Jesus, although he's explaining the concept of the law of retaliation, he is not talking about the law of retaliation itself. He's talking about the wrongful teachings that have come out of the concept of the law of retaliation and that the people have, have responded wrongfully, right? Okay, uh, right? Because they're not responding wrong to eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They have been saying, instead of doing those things, they think, oh, revenge is okay. And so they have had that heart of revenge inside of themselves, and they have done those four examples that Jesus has brought up. And that those four things, those types of examples of a wrongful revenge in a daily life is wrong. And that is what he is rebuking. And so what I am saying, what I believe in is not weakening Jesus' points, a law of retaliation. It's that Jesus is actually only talking about these points. And he's talking about this revengeful heart and not rather the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And so that is why I believe these types of interpretations are correct. And so our third point today, wow, um, it's only 11.22, but time has... Is has is so short, uh, and time hasn't gone by. Today's manuscript is, you know, not a shorter amount than other times, but uh, we don't have a lot left. We're already at the end, and the third point is the shortest. The first was the longest, and the second was uh, average, and the third point is the shortest. Anyways, our third point. Repeat after me. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And so during this time, during the um, biblical times, this was very common, right? And it's common amongst our church as well, amongst our associate pastors. They do not have their own will, free will, right? If they come to our retreat center, they do not, it's not just one mile. Right? There, if you walk, uh, I think we walked for maybe seven hours up the mountain. And then the next day, you know, people were rigid and they could not move. And so last week, maybe seven hours. Uh, I, I don't usually hike uh, that long, but uh, our... The wild ginseng, there were so many wild ginseng there. And the, the wild ginseng was telling me, come here, come, come take me. And so I had to go dig them up. They were weird. Right, so I had to go. And so last week I, I got a lot of wild ginseng. I dug it up. And so uh, I hope you expect great things for my um, hiking blogs. Right, and I, I have a lot of videos to show you as well. Uh, I'm saying all these points, this side point right now, because I'm almost done with the sermon. There's not much more to say. But um, the type of person a uh, ginseng digger really wants to uh, find is uh, the thing that they want to find the most is a special type of ginseng that's almost impossible to find. And um, it's an incredibly rare uh, ginseng. But the type of, um, but that one's too hard to find. So instead of that, what people want to find, what uh, these people want to find is a um, badam ginseng. It's a different type of ginseng that's also special. Uh, but it, it's, this is also a rare type of ginseng. Um, but I found it last week. And so I hope you all are excited uh, or interested in um, seeing this uh, video later on. But anyways, so, so this type of going against one's free will is happening today as well. Uh, and it happens in our church. How, how, many, how many miles do we walk usually? I, I'm saying this as a joke. But during that time, the Roman army right, to anyone who was strong and uh, able to work, they had the right to commandeer, com uh, commandeer any of these types of men. 
And so in any area that the Roman uh, army was there, they were able to use them as transporters or guides, and they could force them to do so. They had the authority to do that. And so if they needed to move stuff from one end to a different end, they would just take people, anyone on the street, and they would say, they would force you to go around a mile, right? They would say, Can, go from here to there, right? And they use someone else as well. So you, so they say, uh, hey, let's take this at least a mile, right? And then they take someone else there and say, hey, take it about a mile. And so these people would continue to go a mile after a mile after a mile. And you know, these people were not just playing around, right? They were working. And during that time, it's different from our times, everyone was working with their bodies. And so, you know, they're doing their diligent work for their own selves. But then all of a sudden, the Roman army comes and says, hey, take, take this um, stuff, carry this stuff and take it to over, uh, over there. And they would force them to do a work that was not their own. And we see this in Simon of Cyrene, uh, in the story of Simon of Cyrene in Mark 15, 21. It says, uh, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And so I think everyone who read that verse was very um, envious of this Simon, no matter how heavy the cross is, because it was such an honor, a glory to do so. And so when I, whenever I read this verse, I was very envious. If I was at that spot, I was right there. And so to carry the cross of the Lord is a glorious thing and an honor-filled thing, and it's a blessing and a favor, but because the Roman officer asked him to do so, it was not a welcomed thing. It was not a happy thing, and it was tiresome, and it was uncomfortable to be asked to do so, and people reluctantly gave in to these requests. And the reason why the Israelites hated this even more, the Jewish people hated it more, was that it was a humiliation, a show of humiliation of the oppressed, right? Would they do this to the Roman citizens? No. They only asked the people who were oppressed by the Roman Empire, right? They didn't have any power, right? If they were called to do so, they would have to go and do it. Right? If they had to, if they were asked to hold uh, transport material for a mile, they would have to do so. And so they were degraded in this manner. And so the Jewish people hated to do so. And they had a lot of anger about these requests. And you know, it's a very normal thing to be angry at. But Jesus says even this is wrong, right? Because so many people hated the Roman soldiers. Right? They hated all of that. They hated them. They, they detested them. But they reluctantly gave in and they did their actions. But Jesus is saying, for that's normal for normal people. But Christians are the light of the world, are the salt of the earth. And so they need to be different. And so Jesus has included this as one of his examples. Jesus, against these acts that are, done, that are um, unpleasant, he says to not get angry for this and to instead voluntarily seek it out. Thankfully, during uh, these days, except for at our retreat center, this does not happen very much. But my son is going to go to the Korean army soon. But in the army, this happens very, very often. Right? And so that's when I think this word will be very helpful. And it seems like it, this has nothing to do with us, but it actually does. Because our so society is not very just, right? In our family, in our schools, in our workplaces, right? It's not very just, uh, right? They don't only give you work to do that you need to do, right? They don't ask you to do things that only you need to do that are good. And so inside of us, we might have this heart of anger, this heart of hostility that comes up from having to do things that we weren't supposed to do. And so in our lives, in our workplaces, there are many times that we experience these things where we're forced to do things that we do not want to do. And we might experience this. There are so many situations that we can experience this in. And what should we do then? We need to remember this word. 
Right? If anyone asks you to go a mile, you should go too. Why? Not because they're good. Not because they're just. But because you are a Christian. And you are someone who is transformed. And you are the one who has the principles, the characters of God. And you are one of love. So if someone asks you to go a mile, then with joy, go too. And so while I was preparing this sermon, there's someone that I remember. There's someone I thought of. And that person is the one with the ID, Refreshing Wind. In our cafe, in our online community, in our online blog, uh, the ID, uh, Refreshing Wind, he's a elementary teacher. And he uploaded a testimony a long time ago where he talked about that he did the works in their school that no other teacher wanted to do. And he volunteered, and he did that work. And uh, the testimony was that everyone who watched him do that, they were transformed and changed, and uh, it was a great testimony. But I tried to find it, but he has uploaded so many blog posts that I could not find where that testimony was because I wanted to use it in our sermon today. It was harder than even finding a, um, a wild ginseng. And so because I could not find it, I gave up. And I thought, oh, if... Our ID Refreshing Wind was a sole beloved member. I could ask him. But then I was shocked when I came and stood up on our podium today because from what I know, he, he's not part of our soul uh, main branch and he's somewhere else usually. But he's sitting right here in the front row. And that's why I thought there was a refreshing wind today. Perhaps because he's here. But anyways... I think, I'm sure you all have read that before too, that testimony, right? All those uh, things that other teachers didn't want to do, uh, those types of duties, those types of classrooms that other people did not want to teach, but that he did it with love. And so other teachers were touched and people uh, accepted Christ. And that, so this was such a great testimony. And I thought in the past when I read it, I thought this is truly a practical role model, right? An example. It's not something that's grand, but it's, it's the meticulous small actions that God would delight in. And this is a very important thing. And so last night when I uh, ate dinner and I heard Pastor Kim's, um, what she's doing these days, it's that she had these different projects, right? Where you have to read all of my books or you have to read all of the Bible. And if you read all of my books once, then you need to read twice or three times or four times. There are some people who, who've read all of my books four times in a row. And I think you don't have to do that, right? If you read it too much, you're going to get sick of it, right? The Bible you have to read forever. But I think if you read it twice, my books are enough. You don't need to keep reading it. But anyway, it's your free will. But after doing all of that, Because when you're reading a lot or you're, you're not able to um, focus on your family, right? You're, you're negligent to your husband, to your children. And so the next project that she made was a cleaning the house project, right? That's what I heard, to clean the house, to organize the house. And apparently this project has taken over and it was a great success. Because uh, husbands were so excited that, and they said, wow, the church asked you to do this? And so people really enjoyed it. And so, you know, if they had time left over, they went to their relative's house and they cleaned their houses. And so people were touched and they came out to church. And so those types of testimonies are coming up apparently. And she told me about this, that this, she started it as something very simple, but it, it is taking over like a storm. And so people, beloved, um, our people don't need a magnificent, magnificent thing. They, they don't need something crazy. They're not changed by the crazy, but they're changed by the small, right? When you harvest in the Bible, it says, don't take all of the grain, right? Leave some for the poor, right? Don't take all of, all of um, the fruit, right? Leave a little on the top. Right? Leave it for, um, for the poor people and even for the beast, for the animals. And this is the command of, of the Creator God who has ruled over the nations and the universe. Right? That God is, has such a meticulous love. Right? He says, don't, don't take all of the grains on the field. Don't take all of the fruit in the field. 
right? Right, why does God give the command? Hey, if anyone has taken the cloak as collateral, give it back to them when the sun sets because what are they going to sleep with? Right? He, he's such a grand God and he gives that tiny command. And so just as the one who is truly diligent and loyal is the one who is loyal with small things, the one who is truly full of love is the one who is uh, loving with small meticulous things. And so I think our refreshing wind has truly refreshed the Lord with his small actions. It's not the huge things. It's the small actions. And that is what will touch people. And so through the um, Sermon on the Mount, we need to become the Beatitude people and have greater righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. But not only that, but that through the Sermon on the Mount, we will become just like God, who is the meticulous God, not just the great and almighty love, but the meticulous love of God, that we will have this God, we will have this love, and that we will be like the characteristics, we will be like the nature of God, and be more like Him. I hope that you all will be ones who meticulously copy the Lord, because this amazing beauty does not come from a crazy mountain or anything big but it comes from starting from a wild flower right when you go when you go up a mountain right i think those wild flowers are so much more beautiful than the flowers that we cut and put in our homes so there's so much beauty in those tiny small things beauty does not come from grand grandiose things so when we believe in the lord who is love when we become like him and when people see us, and our families see us, and our friends see us, and our coworkers and neighbors see us, they will see that we will become more beautiful and like Christ. And I hope that happens. Like David said in Psalm, and I see your beauty in your home. Right? In Corinthians, in Second Corinthians 3, it says, As I see your face, I desire to be like you. Right? to see that meticulous love of God, to receive that love. And now we need to be like that love. Amen? We need to meticulously watch and see God's love and be more like Him. And I hope we will continue to do so and continue to be like Him. That when we go to heaven, we will be like the sun that shines. You don't have to ha be a missionary or a pastor or uh, have a great ministry to be grand, to be great in heaven. But it's that you are like God, that you are in His image, and that you stay diligent with even the small things, whether it's a visible or not, that you are diligent with it. And that when you are that kind of person, you will become the great person in heaven. And I hope you and all, I both can be that person and I bless you in Jesus' name. Let us remember what we heard today and become that kind of person. Not a famous person, not a person who does something big or grandiose, but it's that to be like the meticulous God. And no, no matter if nobody else does or sees what we do, God does. And He sees that small love that we do that small action that we have committed to. And so our meticulous God will see that and know and recognize it and delight in it. And that God, when He acknowledges it, He will let us become that person. Someone who is acknowledged by God. Someone who God delights in. Lord, that is who we want to be transformed and to be like, to re realize this word today to receive the Spirit and to be shaped. Let us pray. Lord, through the Word today, we have seen You. Lord, You know everything. Lord, with your meticulous love, you are watching us. You have come to us. 
and you have provided and watched over us. Father God, you are my God. We want to be like you, Lord. Starting from the small things, God, may your heart pour out to us. And Lord, you have lived, Jesus, you have lived as an example to us. Lord, through your word, let us reflect through your word on our lives. How much am I following God in my life, in my family, in my workplace, my, with my neighbors, with my relatives? How am I showing you what is my center? Lord, let us be like you. Lord, to start from the small things in our lives. To truly be like you. So that so many people in our lives can see you. That I can glorify you through my life. Lord, do we have revenge in our hearts? Do we have hatred and anger in our hearts? Lord, may all of that disappear through you. May we instead have your heart. The heart to serve souls. To be like you. To listen and read the word. And hear and read and see of you, of your beauty, so that we can be like you, Lord. That every single day we can live out that life. Holy Spirit, will you wake us up? That as we pray today, that this word will shake me, that it will be a light upon my life, that it will become my reality. We want to be someone that can see your beauty, Lord. Lord, will you let your beauty take over my life? To see your beautiful love, your meticulous love, and that I can experience this, Lord. Father God, will you transform us? You have showed great grace in our lives. You have shined your beauty on our lives. And Father God, we now want to be ones who can share that with people. Not not to do grand acts towards you, but through small actions of comfort for others. To know what kind of life that Christians need to live. to become more mature, Lord. Father, will you let Jesus be preached to the nations through me? Father, that people will not see my limitations, but that they will see your love and that joy will be restored. So will you let a new heart arise in our hearts every single day to see how amazing you are How beautiful and good you are, Lord. Lord, let us show our good works to everyone around us. To be that light. To be like the sun and the moons that shine. Lord, to give evidence of you, Jesus, Lord. Lord, just as you have shown us, let us follow in your example and to act out this love. 
to not resist the evil ones, but to love, to become love, and to love them. Lord, to not repay evil with wickedness, but to repay them with love. Lord, will you take away all hearts to revenge? Lord, to not look at anything else, but to only look at you, Lord, and to act out this love. Lord, to live this life with that purpose, God, that we bow down in front of you, and we pour out your anointing. Lord, we pour out the grace to live this life. Father, will you work through us? Lord, will you mold us? Lord, will you mold our lives meticulously? Lord, everything that where we say, this is enough, Lord, will you break those thoughts? Lord, we want to be more like you, more like your nature, more like your character, God. God, that we're still not enough. Lord, you look at us in detail, Lord. Lord, you look at the small things that we do. Lord, you have been looking at our, our thirst, at the tiny thirst that we have in our lives. Lord, and you have been looking to see who will fill those moments of thirst. Lord, if there is anyone who is thirsty next to me, if there is any child, if there is anyone who is thirsty, Lord, may I be the one who fills their cup. Father God, I want to be able to do this, Lord. Lord, you have watched over me in detail. You have counted all the hairs on my head. You have watched over me. You have protected me. Lord, this is how much you care for me. And Lord, may I also see of those souls that you have given to me, that you have given to me as my responsibility. May I also search after them. May I also care for them and to love them. Will you give me the heart to do so? Abba Father, you said, what you have done to the least, you have done to me. What you have done to the least of these people, you have done to me, is what you have said. Lord, will you let me live life doing the greatest to the least? Lord, to those that nobody sees. Lord, to those nobody cares for. Father, may I know of their pain. Father God, may I know of their sadness. May I know of their heavy hearts, God. God, is there anyone like that near me? God, is there anyone like that in my family? Abba, Father. Amongst my relatives. Amongst my neighbors. Is there anyone who is hurting? Who is wicked? Who is... How much of their pain do we know, God? How much of their problems have we been hoping? Father God, will you let us act in love? Father God, to those who are truly the least of the least, may we go to them with your heart. Lord, may we serve them with your heart. Lord, may we love them with your heart. Lord, will you pour out grace upon grace so that we can do this? Father, will you let us become love? Lord, as we are right now, we cannot love. But at this time, if you pour out your love upon us, we will be able to do what was impossible. Lord, if you pour out your heart to love, we will be able to love. Lord, let us know what you truly desire so that we can do the works that you delight in. Father God, will you pour out this grace to exceed everything with your love. That we will not resist the evil ones, but love 
are in enemies this well, God. That we will be diligent and loyal to even the small things in life. Father, will you pour out this heart when no one is focused on it? When no one is interested on those people? Father, may, be, may I be one who can share your love amongst the actions and things that nobody else cares about. God, may we reflect on those things. Because those are the things that you see. Those are the things that you delight in. Father, let us refresh your heart. Oh, you pour out, pour out your spirit to do this. That when you see us, that you can say you have been a kind and faithful servant. Lord, will you give us and let us be transformed to be ones who can do even greater works than this. To every day be washed in your word. Will you pour out the grace to be transformed to a vessel that is glorious that will give you all the glory. Lord, to live by the word that you have called us to in the Sermon on the Mount. That we will have better righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. But not only that, but with your love, with your heart, with your mercy and compassion that we live out our lives. Lord, will you transform us? We truly, truly delight you, God. Lord, to give you this fruit. Lord, will you give us this possibility? Lord, so that people will say, Oh, as a Christian, you are different. Oh, that people will know what true Christians are like. That people will know what, what truly believing in you is like. Father God, will you mold us? Abba Father. Abba Father. All the wrongful teachings of man, Father God, will you break them in our hearts? Or will you break it in the Korean church? Father God, will you restore your words, your love, your teachings in the Korean church? May we be made anew with your teachings and be completely transformed. Father God, will you allow this to happen in our lives? Lord, to reveal you. Lord, let us be that church in Korea. To be those Christians in Korea where your beauty can shine. May we be transformed by your word daily. Father God, may you do new works through our lives. Though you pour out grace like a waterfall and to engrave this truth inside of us. Lord, will you pour out the heart to do this, the strength to do this. Father, will you completely change the flow of the church in Korea? Lord, will you reform the Korean church? That we will, as beloved church, first start this new flow. To give the stream of life, Lord. Lord, that we can be sent out, God. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Lord, will you pour out your anointing? Spirit of the Lord, will you come as grace and be with us? Father, will you work as your spirit? and pour out your heart upon us. Lord, you pour out your love. Lord, you love those who are broken. And you fill all the details that are empty, God. Lord, will you work as that love in our lives and pour out that life inside of us. that we can be diligent to everything that you have asked us to do, that you have called us to do, 
to all the responsibilities that you have given us. That through each and every one of us, Lord, that you can work through us. Father God, will you pour your spirit like water upon us with this new heart, with this new love, that we can love you, Lord, and to love the souls and to serve. Father, will you pour out this grace? Lord, would you write a new history? Lord, through this newly changed life of Christians, Father, will you completely transform our faces? And through this truth that our senior pastor is preaching, may so many Christians reflect upon themselves and work, Lord, to know that you are the light, that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So that we can do all that we need to do as the salt and the light. May all of these lives be transformed. Lord, to witness you in this world, Lord, that is what we desire. Lord, we look at all that God is going to do, Lord. Lord, we look at all that you will do, and we expect great things, Lord, and we will work. Lord, may your church continually be renewed. May your nations be renewed so that your work can be done, that this truth can be spread. Lord, will you transform us, that whenever you act, Lord, that we will also be changed with you as the support troops, Lord. Though we will rely solely on the Spirit of the Lord, Lord, we desperately desire to live out our lives with your word. Lord, will you restore us to be in your image. Lord, in that love that you have poured out to us. Father, we want to live that life where we spread that love to others, to those who are poor, to those who are weak, to all of those people who need your love. May we become that love and spread out and flow out to them. Lord, you pour it out. Lord, will you break our selfishness? Will you break our selfish thoughts and instead live out our lives with the word of truth? Lord, will you pour out your grace upon our senior pastor and pour out sevenfold blessings that through this word of truth of our senior pastor at Beloved Church that this will be spread out to the nations, that doors will be opened. That with this right truth, so let us continue on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now our senior pastor will come out and pray for our offering and end with the benediction. Let us pray. Father, we thank you When we think of your love and grace, we thank you, we praise you and worship you and give you all the glory. Lord, you miraculously opened our doors to the missions in Africa. And through that, so much fruit has um, um, grown. And Lord, we thank you and love you and worship you for that. Lord, you have started all of this. Lord, will you continue to work? Lord, not only in Burundi, but will you let everywhere in Africa hear of your word and let so many souls be saved and may the church be reformed and may the great harvest and the uh, 
the great revival come about. Lord, will you have pity upon uh, the Republic of Korea and will you let Korea be awakened? Lord, let us see everything that is happening in Africa, in Korea, in America, in Canada, and in Europe and Asia as well. Father, will you work so that that can happen? Lord, there is no one else we can rely on but you. We only rely on you. And through your hand and strength, will you allow this to happen? Will you allow it to happen, Lord? Lord, thanking you, we have given you offering. We have given you Sunday offering, tithe offerings, and different types of offerings. Lord, we receive all the glory and be lifted up high. Lord, upon the families, each individual who has given you an offering, we bless them. And Lord, will you pour out your blessings? Will you allow them the blessings to hold blessings in both hands? Will you pour it out? Lord, will you let them reap what they sow? Lord, will you let them have the blessings of Abraham and to become the root of all blessings and so that through beloved church and our members, not only will our country live, but also in Africa and all the nations, will you allow that to happen just like the prophecies say? Lord, your people have prophesied and just as you have shown Pastor Kim and you have shown me in my dreams, will you allow the, all those things to occur in real life? Lord, will you allow it to happen? And Lord, Almighty God, will you allow those prophecies to occur? And may we continue to receive revelations of the word and greater uh, healings and gifts of the Spirit and blessings amongst our members. Lord, will you pour out more blessings upon my members for these works to happen? And Lord, from head to toe, may all illnesses be gone in Jesus' name. May they be gone in Jesus' name. May they be healed in Jesus' name. May they be healed in Jesus' name. May they be healed in Jesus' name. And may they be made strong in Jesus' name. Will they be made strong in Jesus' name? And may all wicked and evil spirits be gone in Jesus' name. And may they be freed. May they be freed spiritually. May all uh, evil uh, depression be gone in Jesus' name and anxieties and worries be gone in Jesus' name. May they be made new and filled with the Spirit and filled with the Lord. In Jesus' name, I bless and pray. Amen. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with the hearts of all the people who have worshipped on this Sunday and with their families and children and businesses. With the church, the city, this country, and North Korea, Israel, Africa, and all the nations, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>